What's up, Ego Hackers? Welcome to the C.S. Joseph podcast. This is season 18, Cognitive Mechanics. And today we're discussing unconscious development, unconscious focused, in terms of our explanation of what the octogram actually is. I would like to make a note, though, that season 35, which is technically publicly available on the YouTube channel, that particular playlist and also available on the podcast. Chris was doing it, but I'm taking it over. And uh, while the first episode is done, I'm going to be re, uh, rewriting the subsequent episodes, instructing them a little bit differently to simplify, uh, to simplify that particular uh, lecture series. So we're going to be going piece by piece through the octogram, including explanations of what the deadly sins and the living virtues are, shadow pull, aspiration pull, for each of the temple wheels. Which will be great because a lot of people don't really understand just the little basics. We're just going to be going at it from a very basic perspective. While more of the intermediate content like this is staying behind the paywall and then also uh, what we have in the uh, Ego Hacking Your Fear Masterclass. So yeah. So. Unconscious development, unconscious focus. That one thing that uh, everyone's like trying to be, but they really shouldn't want to be it, you know, for some reason. I remember when we first uh, announced the octogram and a bunch of ego hackers in the community were like, oh, you know, Chris and Chase, you know, they're UDUF. I want to be UDUF too. And it's just like, no, no, you don't. You do not want to be unconscious developed, unconscious focus. You do not want to be that way in any particular situation in your life. I mean, it's bad enough, you know, that we have subconscious developed and unconscious focus, which is decay energy. It's bad enough that we have that. But it's far worse to be in unconscious developed, unconscious focus, which is despair energy, right? These are the people who have had really terrible childhoods and then also terrible adulthoods, basically, consistently, because the environment around them continues to put them in that position over and over and over. And it doesn't matter what they do, they just can't escape. It's like they are slaves in their own reality, which is uh, pretty lame. My God, that's frustrating, but whatever. You think it's the gloves? <laughs> you think it's the gloves? I don't know. But hey, I mean, unconscious develop, subconscious focus, right? That's what it's gonna do, you know what I'm saying? But you know, yeah, I mean, I was unconscious developed, unconscious focus. I mean, I, I've told the story before, like as to why I was, right? And the reason why I was is because, you know, like <laughs> in my childhood, it's like every single day going to church, every single day. God, those guys are annoying. Anyway, so as a child, for example, like my mother, she'd run the phones and run the office uh, Monday morning, etc., which is like really annoying. Like, really annoying. She'd take me there and I'd be alone. You know, I'm a little ENTP and I'd be alone at the church on Monday. And then Tuesday, it was choir practice. Same thing. She was in the choir. She did that. You know, Wednesday. Then it was dance practice. Also running the office again. Take me to church again. Thursday, it was midweek service. She'd have to prep for midweek service. My family is always the first people to be there for midweek service. And then the last to leave, right? Friday, the pastor and leader of the church... Didn't want to have anyone going out and partying on Friday night, so he called this thing a righteous party, and everyone would go to righteous party, basically. And uh, it was yet again more church. Saturday, I actually finally had a day where there was nothing to do with church in my childhood, except I was supposed to be doing nothing but chores all day long. And then Sunday, up 7.30 in the morning, <laughs> get to the church about 8, 8.30, open the doors at the church, 
and stay there for like eight or nine hours and be like the last person to close the doors at the church. See what I'm saying? So basically, like my childhood, six days out of the week, I was at the freaking church. It was really annoying. You know, being the pastor's kid, like, really sucked. Let's be honest. So, in that particular moment, you know, on top of the fact that my dad basically wanted me to be a preacher and I became a biblical scholar as a result of that, but mostly, you know, my biblical scholarly uh, capabilities is just me getting to the point where I'm just like, okay, hey, while that is the case, while that is true, I'm just here really just to debate, debate my dad, you know, got to fight back a little bit. But ultimately, my childhood is what led me to being unconscious developed. And then in adolescence, on top of the fact that I was like, well, not even in adolescence, like starting at um, six years old, I became the most obese person in the school, maybe a second or third to like two others. But I was huge. And I was like three, almost, just, just, just uh, 13 pounds shy of 300 pounds when I started high school. I weighed in at 14 years old at 287 pounds. Absolute uh, horrible situation. So off of being expert intuition hero, being entirely dejected all the time, uh, which means I wasn't even anyone's choice. Friends. Girls, it didn't matter, just any person, basically, right? You know, what's a TI user to do in that particular moment? Well, cover it up with pride, naturally. Which is really frustrating. Very frustrating. Entirely um, problematic. But then that extended further into my adolescence. Cognitive focus continued to remain to be unconscious focus. Pressure from my family to marry someone I shouldn't have. And then uh, homelessness in my 20s. I spent a very, very large amount of time in my 20s struggling even to eat. Struggling to even have heat. Struggling to take care of myself. And just homelessness. I learned real quick how to lie, cheat, and steal in order to survive. What's fascinating about that is that, like, when you look at the UDUF types, uh, like wrath types, especially the ISTJ, you know, they're like, oh, survival is my justification. And I remember even thinking that myself, like, I'm justified to do anything I want or whatever I need because here I am trying to survive so I can just do whatever it takes, you know. Using the money that I gained from impersonating a man at a Fortune 500 company for about two years, I used that money and I became an arms dealer for a little bit after that. As an arms dealer for about three years. And that ended on October 1st, uh, 2014. And I was no longer an arms dealer. Why? Because my arms business went down in flames because the Russians invaded Crimea. And Barack Obama decided it would be a good idea to put up an embargo against the Russians. A trade embargo. Therefore, I couldn't import parts anymore. No matter, like, whatever I did. And I was also very foolish and uh, did not use the cash reserves of the company to switch over to the Chinese parts. I was still dependent on the uh, Russian parts. So we went out of business, basically. Closed up shop, moved on. Luckily, my business partner bailed me out with the creditors, except uh, left me with a $25,000 credit card uh, under the company. But I did end up paying that off. I paid that off first. And then I started working hard to pay off my student loans. After I basically lied... Uh, my way into becoming an engineer for the largest hospital conglomerate in the country, or at least in California, where I did uh, amazing things, actually. I did some amazing things. I actually saved lives there, especially a man who uh, had heart surgery. He was going to die if I didn't get the images back up for the surgeon, and I did just in time, and he lived. But it's stuff like that, right? Just the interesting, uh, interesting things in life. And I remember like being on my knees at 27 years old before God Almighty thanking him for my little one-bedroom apartment in Yuba City, California. That, and all I had, all I had was a little tiny Office Depot desk, a uh, swivel chair, and an air mattress. That's all I had and nothing else. 
actually took me like another year before I finally actually got a mattress. So it was nice not being homeless anymore. You know what I'm saying? It's really nice. You know, people, they always judge by appearances, but they don't really actually, they're not worth, you know, they don't, they're so shallow, they're not interesting in trying to, uh, interested in trying to figure out like what is beneath the surface. Oftentimes the people that smile the most are the people who suffer the most. And that's no different, especially when it comes to the UDUF people of the world. Unconscious developed, unconscious focused. The despair. So, the breadth of the octogram. We know that the octogram discerns four variants for each type. These four variants are different shades and flavors of each type. There are layers that determine octogram influence beneath what is easily visible. Octogram deals with development and focus. Cognitive development and cognitive focus exist on a temple level and a four sides level and an individual function level. A person's octogram reveals their preference for which temple, which side of the mind, and yes, even which functions they prefer. So what is, what exactly is unconscious development, unconscious focus? Remember, people in your life soft lock you into you know, just by you being in their presence or them being in your presence, your cognitive functions are getting soft locked into different sides of the mind. It's where your environment is soft locking you into your superego consistently. And you're developing neural pathways in your brain just to deal with the rough situation because your ego is entirely disabled within that environment. UDUF is the apex of ego disablement. Unconscious development and unconscious focus means that the psychological nutrition it takes to foster the ego is absent. UDUF types were likely subjugated to intense trauma and a ton of responsibility. UDUF types tend to develop hyper self-reliance because their environment and others in their environment did not support their inferior and child specifically. UDUF types also in some respects approximately have one and a half inferior functions because UDUF types spend so much time in the shadow. Their demon can act like a secondary inferior because the demon's careful use is required for survival. One of the exchanges for access to all of the eight functions is adaptability and skill in different contexts, different environments. But this is also basically known as neuroplasticity, right? Our brains, the way our brains actually work, right? Neuroplasticity. It's uh, our, our brains to adapt to the environment and to the people within our environment. And people are doing the same thing to us, right? It's the same thing psychologically speaking, right? So, in some respects. One of the, okay, one second, I need to figure out my place here. So, UDF types have, built, have a built pragmatism centered around survival. Understanding that ideals quickly erode when subjected to harsh circumstances. They are despair because they are caught between the two worlds of their ego and superego, and they are required to dig into their soul just to survive. Despair is also the archetype of cope. And although the UDUF can achieve great things, it can come at an awful price. Again, just like wrath types like ISTJs and ENFPs, survival is my justification. Which is really sad. It's really sad, all things considered. A lot of people oftentimes utilizing their survival to get, basically get away with anything in their life. And that's not exactly accurate. That's not, a, you know, or, well, it is accurate, but it's not exactly a good thing. But it just goes to show that the brain will do everything and anything to survive. You know, that whole uh, tribe above self approach. It's all about tribe above self. Thankfully, unconscious focus does not have to be permanent, and the wisdom the UDUF can extract can be transformed for self and others, especially if they can move to UDSF. UDSF is the octogram variant known as hope. It's the hope energy. But from a UDSF perspective, it actually takes so much effort and so much willpower and so much discipline and so much endurance, right, just to be able to become UDSF because you have to internalize your deadly sin instead of externalizing it. Because you do have people, what they do is they externalize their deadly sin. So my deadly sin is envy, right? So I'd be envious of other people, right? And I'd spend all of my effort envying others and being hateful towards others consistently. 
which would suck. It'd suck a lot. Let's be honest. Say again. The word earnest. Indeed. My podcast, my show. <laughs> We'd have to get to know each other a little bit better before I say that. Why? Sometimes uh, the content I produce is quite private. Private individuals who uh, pay me for that uh, privilege, basically. I am filming, and if people want to listen, they can. But I'd still have to get to know you a little bit more before I uh, tell you what it is specifically about. Well, how are you going to get your message out if I can't even find you online? Well, stick around. I'll give you a card, perhaps. Perhaps? No, bro. Like, if you don't want to share it, then, like, keep it to yourself. But, like, I asked you for information. And I would go I'll give it to you. It. I'll give it to you. Since you're being really nice about it. Mm-hmm. Certainly. Yeah, pull out your phone. Are you on Instagram or something? Sure, we can start there. What's your handle? At CS dot Joseph. C. Oh yeah, PH at the end, yeah. What does your necklace mean? It's our Archangel Michael. Yeah? What do you know of the Archangel? It depends on what uh, spirituality you want to tap into. Hmm. Depends on your so you're someone who's into the occult, then? Curious. I Curious. Have a pastor, so. Same. Mm, what uh, denomination? There you go. Well, he's non-denominational now. What were you raised in? <laughs> a Christian cult, well, actually. Yeah. Same. Full of uh, a lot of uh, terrible things. <laughs> Left it when I was 19. Yeah? After uh, 17, it was fun for me to test it with a minimum of three up to like 14 translations of the Bible with concordance to the Greek and Hebrew, self assigning myself with studies and theology students. Oh, so you're familiar with blueletterbible.com? Uh huh. Excellent. Do you slay the sacred cows of the church? Oh. Why not? <laughs> Oh, well, pastors hire me to uh, pastors hire me to debate them on Sunday morning, and I do slay the sacred cows of the church in front of them. What are your beliefs? They're quite different. Critical thinking in the Bible, for example, something that uh, most people can't handle. For example, my first argument that I make is that the sinner's prayer is a lie, and there's no such thing as getting saved. No, it's not even in the Bible. Exactly. Not at all. Yeah, I saw this fun thing the other day, and I was like, if Jesus is the only, if we're all children of God, and Jesus is the only son of God, that makes us all daughters. <laughs> well, we are a feminine race, after all. Angels are masculine. Humans are math feminine. No. Angels, from their nature, have this thing called tribe above self. But humanity, because we expire and because we are mortal, we have self above tribe. Nope. Oh, no, Joseph. <laughs> it's Chase, actually. Mm. Like the bank. <laughs> I'm Luna. Luna. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been waiting to meet you for a while, actually. Your yeah, reputation well. precedes you. <laughs> From who? Mutual friend. I don't have a lot of those around here. Hmm? That's what he said. <laughs> Who? My boy Tom. Oh, Tommy, I love Tommy. He mm-hmm. loves me too. Mm-hmm. He's been on the show a few times. Has he? 
Mm -hmm. Chip and yeah, him and I made a deal that he would make arrangements for me to meet you about two months ago. Oh, that sounds about right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But he got in a little bit of trouble, ended up in jail for a little bit. <laughs> you know, you working? Self responsibility goes a long way. It does. You working these days? Of course. Never not. Yeah. Getting what you want. Yeah. yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Got to make it happen, one way or another. Yeah. It was nice meeting you. Have a lovely night. Not interested in finding out what uh, Tom and I were uh, hoping for? Probably a threesome, not right now. No thanks. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, bottom line is what I'm trying to say is that a conscious focus does not have to be permanent. You have to internalize your deadly sin in order to get it to a state of, you know, a more improved state over time. Internalizing deadly sin, it was really hard for me because I had to work hard and put in extra effort to become the envy in the room instead of being so envious of other people, which means I'd have to curb my hatred towards other people who are not, uh, who are earning things that they didn't put effort into and instead really internalize that hatred towards myself in the process. By internalizing that hatred, it's more like, whoa, Chase, you're like actually hating yourself as a result. And it's like, yeah. Actually, actually, yes, it would be. And uh, <laughs> it kind of sucked. The thing is, it's more of like, okay, well, where is that self-hatred? And then it, because I'm internalizing my deadly sin of envy, I'm also internalizing my deadly sin of vainglory. Where it's like, oh, okay, I realize I'm not actually popular at all, right? I'm not the envy in the room, so... All of my effort ended up going into that direction, which means I'd have to make a pact with my X-rated sensing demon to improve my own personal performance, basically, and become a top performer. Such that I've become a better performer where, as an example, I can go to the gym and do pull-ups with 50 pounds strapped around my neck. Sadly, I actually dropped a 45-pound plate doing that on my foot recently. And that really hurt. Luckily, it didn't break. And I'm very thankful that uh, nothing bad happened because... Uh, that kind of injury would have been entirely like debilitating <laughs> in order for me to keep internalizing my deadly sin because by doing so it allows me to be outwardly compassionate to other people and keep the compassion flowing, such as the way of subconscious focus. But the point is, unconscious focus, while it is survival mode for SDUF types and UDUF types, from that perspective, psychologically speaking, it gets to a point where It gets to a point where, uh, <laughs> well, let's just say um, it's so much better for a person in life to actually be outward with their living virtue and share that part of themselves instead of hiding it uh, under a rock or under a basket, as Jesus would say. So, yeah. But UDF types, they're extremely street smart. These are the school of hard knocks people. And uh, it can be, you know, and in general, UDF people are dangerous. They're the ones who actually commit the most heinous crimes out of everybody. SDUF does it as well, but UDF is, is particularly terrible, especially from the perspective of their own individualism. And that can be a problem. So, anyway, so temple preferences. The UDF pulls from their superego temple uh, the most but are still mainly pulling from the shadow. So my superego temple, given that my main temple is heart temple, my superego temple is the mind temple. So I would literally rely on intellectualism to survive, basically, as much as possible, which led to the deadly sin of pride and covering up all of my insecurities and all of my failures and all of my weaknesses uh, because I was weak to be too weak to survive in my own personal environment as a child 
as well as in my adulthood. So I had to heavily rely on intellectualism as much as possible, or at least mind temple, you know, I think I know best. And then I would have mind temple pride, which ended up becoming a huge problem. They have to feed their ego and superego simultaneously because they can't get fully enough nutrition for the other, for either. UDUF body temple types, ENTJs, INTPs, ESFJs, and ISFPs rely on their mind temple shadow, even pulling into their soul temple superego to survive. Personal skill and knowledge mixed with justification are typical leverage points for UDUF body temple types. UDUF mind temple types, ESTJ, ISTP, ENFJ, INFP, rely on their body temple shadow, but can now journey into the heart temple superego, where convictions and passions help them survive and endure. UDUF heart temple types, ENTPs like myself, INTJs, ESFPs, ISFJs, rely on the justification and identity in their soul temple shadow, as well as using um, pride, uh, <laughs> but also journeying to the mind temple superego, where educating and teaching others lessons cultivates their convictions. Basically, increase, I would increase the suffering of others greatly for the purpose of teaching them those big lessons, etc. UDF soul temple types, ENFPs, INFJs, ESTPs, ISTJs, rely on the passion and obsession of their heart temple shadows, but also journey into the body temple superego, where achievement and legacy play a crucial role in propelling them forward. So, functional preferences, however, for the UDUF, the child and the inferior are nearly completely neglected, which also means they can benefit for the, from the most investment from others. When I was UDF, I would just literally suck up all the compassion in the room because my extroverted feeling child had no place in my feeling judging family because my mother is ISFJ, my father's ENFJ, my sister was ESFJ, etc. And then as a result of that, I found myself in a situation where it's like, okay, yeah, that sucks. But my extroverted feeling child meant nothing with all those other FE users in the family. And the family basically looked to me to be the resident FI user, which put me into my ESFP superego consistently, and I built neural pathways. UDF types tend to use their nemesis and critic more often, as well as their demon. But the rule of thumb for the UDUF is that they will do whatever they need to to survive. But the nemesis and critic tend to dominate, as do all the shadow functions. The UDUF perceives that they are on their own, and they often feel drained and spread thin, stretched between extreme tensions that will not be satisfied. The quote, those who are the hardest to love need it the most, comes to mind for UDUF types. And that's absolutely the truth. Entirely the truth. But looking at oneself in the mirror and understanding that the only way for me to actually be loved by others was for me to produce that love, to produce that intimacy for others. One of the worst things about my life is that I never really had an opportunity to be the target of or to receive family. And I would often have to produce family for everybody else in the process, which is very frustrating, consistently frustrating. And oftentimes, even now as UDSF, I still often have to produce family for the sake of others on a consistent basis. which is uh, a huge problem overall. So yeah, a huge problem. So but yeah, folks, that's, uh, that's it for season 18, uh, episode 35, Cognitive Mechanics, what is the UDUF octogram variant uh, to provide you guys additional context for what it is to be UDUF and a little bit on terms of how to get out of it, which is really just internalize your deadly sin so that you can externalize your living virtue and give it to other people. If you want to be shown love, like UDUF people desperately want, they need to learn the skill on how to show love to other people. And hopefully somebody will love them back. So anyway, folks, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys on the next episode.